When you dare to share, you break the silence. When you dare to share, you speak your truth. When you dare to share, you use the full strength of your voice. When you dare to share, it brings opportunity to own your story. So tell it, be heard, and at the same time, your sharing is someone else's learning, inspiration, motivation, empowerment, and hope. There's always an element to each of our stories that remains a secret. For some, we feel it's a dirty little secret. Dare to Share Your Untold Story exposes these secrets in a welcoming and positive way. I encourage each of you out there to dare yourself to share what is yours to tell. When we dare, it is the courage to do something really important. Let this be a vow to each and every single one of us that we take risk, we brave, confront, and face what is, while inspiring and empowering all communities. So let's break that silence and tap into mental beauty. This is Salima Jadavji, your podcast host, a practicing social worker, and your mental wellness connoisseur. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast, episode number 68, She Does It Messy, Transforming Fear into Fuel. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our courageous and daring guest, Rachel Abba. Rachel is a supreme guide and courage mentor to highly intuitive and creative people. She's in the business of supporting other highly intuitive people embrace their high sensing gifts as healing medicine. She's a spiritual thought leader whose training includes transpersonal experiential psychotherapy, medicine wheel facilitation, English literature and mythology, world religions, spiritual sciences, heart core leadership, and wealth consciousness mindset. Rachel's profound wisdom and guidance can inspire positive transformation and wealth generation in people's lives. She encourages individuals that she works with in becoming bold, feeling seen, and accepting themselves as whole, complete beings without judgment. Her unique healing modality supports clients in conscious practices of clarity, courage, compassion, and committed action to feel worthy, confident, productive, and powerful. She welcomes collaborations with other healers, creatives, and leaders committed to excellence and dynamic growth. To all my fellow listeners, before we get started, I'm just dropping in a note to give you a heads up that this podcast might be emotionally triggering for you. We do invite guests onto the show who share openly about extremely difficult life moments with exposure and impact of what the struggles have been like. The intensity of each episode could have a variable impact on your emotional and mental well-being based on your own personal story. If at any point the topic becomes uncomfortable or upsetting to you in any way, please do not pressure yourself to listen. Instead, be kind to yourself, do some self-care, and perhaps give another episode a try. Hey, hey, Rachel. Welcome to the Dare to Share Your Untold Story podcast. Thank you so much, Salima, for inviting me. I am thrilled to be here. So glad you're thrilled because I'm thrilled also. (laughs) (laughs) Really excited to have this opportunity to have you be a guest on the show today. Uh, Rachel, I'm really grateful for your willingness to want to tell your story, Um, that that enthusiasm and the eagerness. It's... um, It's a real joy for me to sit in. I really do feel blessed and honored to encounter guests such as yourself who really like allow me to tap into their vulnerabilities and draw on their strengths and draw on their insight and inspiration. All of that that comes from these stories and gets shared in this space. It's really important for me. I really believe it's important that we, you know, together we take a stance to help break barriers of mental stigma and to keep that process going. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to be here and honored and, and the feeling is mutual. And so, Rachel, in case you're still wondering, this podcast, it's really all about bringing forward untold stories that people go through, whether directly about a mental health struggle or something else. And we know that no matter what the story, there is impact on one's own mental health in some way, which remains tucked away. And the gift of this platform, it serves in a way to break barriers of mental stigma that have been conditioned in our society. So today, together, 
My hopeful mission is that for both of us to encourage people to share and tell what individuals typically have reservation to express. And so, of course, I continue to bring forward a trend. It's called the mental beauty rethink. Rachel, I am really curious. Please tell me what first comes to mind for you when you hear this phrase, the mental beauty rethink. Wow. Well, first of all, I love the idea of mental beauty. That is not mm-hmm. something that, you know, in my experience, I've I've seen. Um, and what I hear is um, really a celebration of mental diversity. Mm-hmm. And um, it speaks to the, the unique pains and experiences we each have as being um, beautiful and valuable and most of all legitimate, right? Mm-hmm. That our minds are you know, they have a place in this world and, Mm -hmm. you know, they have value. So, and it plays into um, part of, you know, what I believe in, which is accepting ourselves as whole and complete beings without judgment. And so not judging our minds, Mm -hmm. that embracing of self is truly healing. I love it. The way you coined it, celebration of mental diversity. That is so so cool. It's cool because I never, like, I didn't think about it in that way, <laughs> but even though that's the intention, right? So it's, it's so nice that language can be so beautiful and uplifting and, and it, it really can, you know, um, encourage different thought processes or crack open even further at the way we're interpreting something, right? Yes. Yes, definitely it can. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much for, you know, giving us that insight and that input it's marvelous. Thank you Amazing. for coining the term. <laughs> Look at you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just happened one day. You know, it's one of those things where it just kind of just like I just up. got a download of this inspiration. Yes, and you know exactly. what? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's how you roll. Like and you know what? It really, it really tied in. It's like, okay, that was the missing piece of this mission, right? So yeah. it's that it's that's the part of that transformation and integration of the entire mission and intention of this podcast. So it's like, let's transform it now. Let's transform and, you know, bring back to the community a new Powerful. way. Yes. All right, Rachel. So if you feel ready, we can get our interview going. So let's unpack that story of yours. Without further ado, give us the newspaper headline of how you would title your untold story. How would it read? It would read, Supernatural Woman Comes Out of Hiding to Tell All. All right, say it one more time. Supernatural Woman Comes Out of Hiding to Tell All. I can tell you're not hiding anymore because you're saying it with (laughs) such vigilance and passion. So Supernatural Woman Comes Out of Hiding to Tell All. Can you touch on what this title means for you? Well, you know, it it speaks exactly what it says about the idea of hiding, right? And this Mm -hmm. has been an overriding theme Mm -hmm. in my life. And, um, and, you know, we're going to dive deeper into it. Um, But the idea of, you know, coming face to face with myself and getting honest with who I am and Mm -hmm. being bold enough to step out into the world and allow myself be seen. Mm -hmm. Um, no matter what, because, you know, that matters and my story is legitimate. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stepping into my life and being, you know, being front and center and leading from the front is, you know, was very, very, um, critical in my journey. Yeah. I mean, the theme of hiding and all of the other elements, which you are now alluding to. As a master hider. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah, this you were a master hider. You know what happens on this podcast, right? Yes, I do. <laughs> so I think there was a in a private conversation the, the term excavation was used. So yes. I think that's where we're about to go. Tell us what your untold story is all about. Well, um, you know, there there almost like several arms to it, but really okay. at the heart of it, um, I would say began um, you know, as a child, as a baby where, um, and this is where the supernatural piece comes Mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's all around identity. Who am I and Mm -hmm. who am I being in the world? Who am I expected to become all of these expectations? And very clearly right at the very beginning, I, I, I had awareness, 
right? As mm-hmm. a baby, I had awareness. And this was something um, that my my mother later shared with me um, that she she felt very uncomfortable with me, <laughs> being alone mm-hmm. with me, um, because mm-hmm. there was just something super creepy about me because it's like I wasn't just like a regular baby because I'm I'm the youngest of four so Mm -hmm. she had been on this rodeo like you know she wasn't new and Mm -hmm. she's like "Mm, there's something odd about this one and when I would look at her um, I would do so unblinking and it was like I was looking right through into her soul and she just felt super vulnerable and like just exposed and Mm. fragile Mm -hmm. um and so you know and I she also shared that you know I did other things as well I was very um fond of doing a disappearing act where she would as a baby like I was just you know a few months old and Mm -hmm. you know she would leave to go somewhere like just step out of the room and come back and I'd be gone and she would search for like an hour for yeah. where, like, under the bed, between the sheets, she's like, was she mm-hmm. adu- abducted? And I'm a baby. I'm not moving anywhere, right? And so then mm-hmm. she'd be like, oh, my, and then she'd pray, and then she'd come back into the room, and I'd be there. So she started doubting her, <laughs> like, her mental, um, mm-hmm. you know, faculties. And um, I did this often, including, like, other stuff. And I would just, like, you know, and she was like, where are you going? Like, you're here now. You're in this realm you're here now. So could you just please just stay? Like just right. cut it out. Wherever you're going, whatever meetings you're having, right. <laughs> just stop it. Right. right. And okay. so she, mm-hmm. yeah. And so she had that so conversation. With me. And that's Sorry? the message you got from your mom. That's the message you got. Yeah, from that's the, mom. exactly. That was the original mm-hmm. messaging of, and she negotiated and she's like, look, um, I, I get it. I know who you are. I see who you mm-hmm. are. Um, mm-hmm. However, with everything going on and the way the world is and where mm-hmm. we are, because I was born in, in West Africa, Nigeria okay. specifically. Okay. Yeah. And so she was like, not now, like Rachel, whatever this is, just like put it on a back burner right. and let me just, let's just get through this together because life is really tough right now. Okay. And, um, and so I just kind of looked at her and I guess I agreed and, um, and I never did it again. That's how she and- knew. I had agreed. So, yeah. So very early on, I got that message of who I am Mm -hmm. has no place Mm -hmm. here. Right. And then I went on to meet my other siblings. I have two, two brothers and a sister. And, um, and so I lived with them with my dad for a while because my mom and dad had separated. And so we would play, you know, they'd be like, let's play hide and go seek. Of course, my favorite game. (laughs) Right. <laughs> and so I would do the same thing, not thinking that it was anything abnormal. And I recall like I'd be in the room with them. I'm thinking I'm right here. Right. And so I'd be looking at them. You. Looking for natural me. for you. Yes. Natural- okay. Now just clarify one thing for me. So when you said that then you had a chance to meet your two brothers and your sister and, and go back to your dad's place. Does that mean like when you were born, there were your other siblings weren't in the home with you? Yes, they were not in their home. So my mom and my dad had separated okay. when I was born. Okay. And so I never grew up with them in my babyhood okay. until later. Okay. Um, so when was I was five. Mom. It was sorry? you and your mom. It was you yes, and your it was mom. me and my mom. Yeah, she okay. was my my buddy, my everything. Okay. And um, yeah, it was us against the world. And you know, when I went to be in this new environment, this new community, again, that story of I don't belong here continued. Mm -hmm. So I never felt safe and I never Mm -hmm. felt at home, even at home. Mm -hmm. I always felt as if, okay, like in a holding pattern, that there's something else that will shift and then I will get Mm -hmm. into Mm -hmm. where Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be. And so I think I you know, I sense that I brought that with me into Mm -hmm. this life where I'm like, I belong somewhere else, but I'm here in assignment and it's temporary. Mm -hmm. Um, And then while I was here, my mom's like, okay. And then I go into another environment with my siblings and again, okay, this is temporary. Mm -hmm. It wasn't what it was, but I'll just, you know, deal with it Mm -hmm. until it Mm -hmm. becomes normal, until I feel normal. And so I never felt normal. You just um, kept even with that. 
I just kept waiting for something right. to shift and something right. to become okay. Mm -hmm. And um, then I, I translated that into, I wasn't okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for something to shift in order mm -hmm. for me to become mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And so how yeah. long did, like, did this pattern repeat itself again? The pattern of not feeling settled. Yeah. And not feeling, well, this continued throughout my life up until, up until recently where, um, I kept, I, I, I was in a holding pattern and I, I never felt, I always had that, um, you know, in the pit of my stomach that, uh, anticipating right. the, the other shooter drop. Right. Um, and so even when everyone around me, you know, was well-intentioned around, um, welcoming me, and putting me at ease, um, I didn't believe it because my mom had said it wasn't safe for me to be, mm -hmm. and I believed her. So, so you got that suggestion early on from your very mom. early. Yeah, I was a few months old, and so you really took it, like you really like took that to heart and embodied that, and it was playing out in your mind even from such a young. Yeah, I took yeah, it on as yeah. my my assignment. Like I mm -hmm. took that on as okay, this is how like almost like that hyper vigilance around mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And I was going to be good about it and I was going to be um you know, I was going to to succeed in my mission kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um I've been asked to do this and boy am I going to, you know, excel at it because it was important enough for her to ask, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm new here. So if she's telling me and I came right. through her, then, well, this new environment, it must be so. Right. And so mm -hmm. that ended up like, you know, informing how I showed up in relationship, how I showed up at school. Um, I was never like I'd hold myself back. I would I never felt a part mm -hmm. of anything. I, I didn't do groups. I was like super lone wolfing life mm -hmm. um, as like, okay, no, I can't trust because I must depend on myself because, well, it's not safe. And so, as I said, it informed everything, but keep in mind that none of this was conscious. Like it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't as if I'm like, okay, I'm not going to trust this person now. It was more right. of my, internal, my template. Yeah. It was a template, like an internal, mm -hmm. just something you'd internalized. Yes. That must have felt really lonely for you. It did. Um, it did for a really long time. But then, you know, even in that discomfort became normalized where mm -hmm. I just I saw myself and then I saw the world like and I never felt a part of it. No matter what was going on, I always felt like an outsider. Mm -hmm. And I would I remember just watching people as a child, you know, just observing them almost like, a, <laughs> you know, um, going out on safari. And mm -hmm. like watching the animals in the wild and be like, right. okay, and, you right. know, the, the family members in their natural habitat. It was like really, you know, I never felt included mm -hmm. even when I was um, because I didn't see myself in my environment. And I, mm -hmm. and I never allowed myself to consider anything else because I, that just never was for me. Right. That's how I saw it through a child's eyes. Mm -hmm. That's how I experienced it. That's how I saw it. And so um, that created this deep observation of my environment and mm -hmm. that, as I mentioned, hypervigilance. Right. Mm -hmm. I will mentally record everything. And I had an extremely rich internal world. Mm -hmm. Right. And as I mentioned, the supernatural piece um, at age, I believe, five, mm -hmm. I was introduced to my um, almost like a, a my spiritual mentor, which is mm -hmm. like an ethereal form. I, I saw them. They introduced themselves to me and I was at a birthday party and I was sitting alone because I wasn't playing with the other children because I'm like, what a waste of time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was in my own, you know, I didn't yeah. get it. The world made no sense to me 
Selena. The way, so the way other children and your peers no and your friends interacted, it just, you were like, yeah. why would I do this? You, what, it made no sense what, to what, me. What is fun about that? Or why would I Yeah, I'm like, why would you be? Right. Yeah, it made no okay. sense. Okay. Absolutely. Right. And even okay. um, as my mom later shared, um, well, I shared with her once I got speech, because part of yeah. the challenge for me and the frustration I felt being in this body was that as a baby, I felt all the baby things, mm-hmm. right? I felt as if I had um, gum in my mouth and I couldn't speak. I had like thoughts and ideas I wanted to express. And I'm like, why won't my mouth work? Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just, I'm like, okay, so that's where the observation, I'm like, I'm going to record everything in my mind. And I, you know, I was very unblinking. I wouldn't blink. Mm-hmm. And my mom would literally blow in my face to get me to close my eyes because I, I didn't want to miss anything. And so the moment Salima, I could speak, <laughs> the moment I could speak, I was like, okay, sit down, <laughs> listen to me. Right. right. This person who came over here and, la, 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 and this uncle, da, 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 and this bird, and she was like, What the to, hell? To say. You had lots to say. I had lots to say. Mm-hmm. And she just like lost it because it's everything I was saying, she remembered it. Yeah. Right. She okay. remembered it. I told her what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, I'm like, and please do me a favor. Stop trying to get people to carry me. I don't want to be held by X, Y, Z. Um, wow. you know, how annoying and, you know, um, wow. it, all and came I would, out. it all came out and she was wow. like, and then she was like, oh my God, I wasn't losing my mind. She was weird. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and so, yeah. And so then that became part of our relationship of, mm-hmm. you know, bridging that gap between the ethereal realms mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and the physical realms. Right. So, Rachel, tell me more about how you were affected, you know, having gone through this journey of really tapping into your supernatural gifts and finding your voice and charting a path, feeling misunderstood for such a, you know, large part of your life with this holding pattern that you described. Tell me more how you were affected maybe in later on in your life or in your adult um, years. Well, um, I would say, I mean, it started with a lot of um, stomach issues. Like I had a lot of stomach aches as a child and that continued into adulthood, that withholding. So I was always like super constipated because I was holding everything down. And that then, you know, coming into adulthood, um, not using my voice, right? Silencing myself. So really all the withholding became normalized for me and it was across the board right whether it's not releasing my bowels whether it's like holding um you know my bodily functions whether it was holding my voice holding back my emotions um my holding back my opinions Mm -hmm. and perspective withholding my contribution in a meeting um withholding you know what withholding my talents all angles from all oh yeah in all angles across the board that's what i did Okay. And so tell me, how did that show up in how you like uh, personal interactions or personal relationships with people? Yeah, I wouldn't fully show up and I would withhold myself from them. So even people who have known me a really long time would be like, I know you, but I don't feel like I really know you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, It's, you know, so that became you know, like a a way of, for me, I experienced that as a way of protecting myself Mm -hmm. and keeping myself safe. And it wasn't personal Mm -hmm. to anyone else. Um, It wasn't meant as a slight or in any way, shape or form. It was just the way I had grown accustomed to um, being, right? Um, It became habit. Yeah. So then how did you let people into your world? How did you let them in? Who did you let in? Very, very, um, well, I would let people, so I, if you can imagine almost like concentric circles, Mm -hmm. so I would let you in, in increments, right? But no one ever got to the core. No one ever got to my inner sanctum. It never occurred to me to let people in to that point because that space felt sacred to me. So I would, you know, I would have even, you know, um, in my previous marriage with my ex-husband, um, he only knew me so much. Well, how and did you I believe into your world? Because because that my, my, 
you know, that is still an intimate connection of yes. allowing someone in quite deeply, mm-hmm. even if you're not fully letting them, them in. How did you do yeah. it? Well, how did I do it? Well, um, I would watch people for a really long time mm-hmm. and determine whether or not they felt safe to me. And then I would let them in in terms of um, sharing about myself, um, whether or not you knew you were in if you've ever been in my home. Mm -hmm. There are many people I've known for a really long time who have never stepped foot beyond my Mm -hmm. threshold. And um, so if I let you into my home, then that meant that, you know, I've let you into my heart. Um, So that was a way I could also tell um, my comfort level with someone and Mm -hmm. whether or not, you know, so the fact that I would be in a relationship with someone, whether it be in friendship, like romantically or platonic, I love people. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I had that desire to, to want closeness with them. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, I had that story of you can't really trust people because if they see you for who you are, Rachel, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. they might judge you, they might harm you. Right. And you don't need that. Um, So that's, that's how, you know, that, that was my inner um, conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I always got encouragement from my, um, my spiritual mentor, like my guide, um, Mm -hmm. to say, open up. They were always encouraging me to open up. Um, yet, you know, I had like one foot on the gas and one on the brakes, right? Right. Like it was like, half in and half out. (laughs) Yes. I was never, I was sitting on the fence and, um, Yeah. But for those like in my life, like if you ask them, they'd be like, oh, yeah, Rachel and I are super tight (laughs) because my level of intimacy and intensity was so rich that they just thought, you know, well, that feels like other things I have in the world. So it must be that. And in my mind, I'm thinking, little do you know just how much deeper we can go. Right. Yeah. And I right. kind of held that as my little secret of mm. what I could do and who I could become in a relationship. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I withheld myself from the world. It's interesting that you said like your dirty little secret because yeah, in, in the introduction of the podcast, <laughs> we talk about it as like the way sometimes it's viewed is like it's a di- dirty little secret. So we want to withhold and we want to keep things away from people and, and not share yes. because we don't want to be shamed and sometimes we're shaming ourselves in the process unknowingly uh, yes. unintentionally mm-hmm. um, but isn't it interesting right that dirty little secret yeah th- there's a lot going on um mm-hmm. in my mind and you know it was that also osc- that mm-hmm. oscillation between um well Rachel what is true right mm-hmm. like what is mm-hmm. true for you versus what you have been told is true right. and what is mm-hmm. your experience And, um, as I said, I never permitted myself to believe and, and live from that space. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and so the, what I kept telling myself was that, um, the moment I do, Mm -hmm. the moment I truly step out and, and reveal, I mean, if my mother couldn't handle it (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she loves me, (laughs) Right. right. Why am I even bothering to even think that anyone else out there would be okay right. with it? Like so why another suggestion, another layer of a suggestion. So, you know, in a in a private conversation, you and I talked about um or it was mentioned, you know, that um in this first marriage, there were some struggles that you encountered as a result of like there was like limitations that you faced as a result of you not feeling like you could show up completely as who you were. Can you speak a little bit to that in terms of how this relationship unfolded, the limitations you faced and how you were affected in in that space? Oh, yes. So let's go there, Salima. (laughs) (laughs) So in this relationship, you know, this was years ago. And we were together for, in total, probably about 14 years. And this was Mm -hmm. like, you know, one of my, I would say my first serious adult um, relationship. And um, I was just, I felt so grateful that someone saw me Mm -hmm. um, and wanted to be with me, right? 
and mm-hmm. um, and that speaks to a worthiness piece. Even though I knew I was all that, mm-hmm. um, I think, you know, in within the relationship, I was just, yeah, I, I would say I just felt so happy um, to be with someone who, with whom I could share really um, deep spiritual ideas and speak on things that I wouldn't necessarily do so with like my colleagues at work mm-hmm. or, you know, and for them not to look at me sideways and question my sanity, right? And like, you know, begin to undermine my every effort and question my being. So that was like the conversation. Yet, um, what ended up happening was that's exactly what um, it ended up being where, um, you know, I started second guessing myself because of Mm -hmm. just, it it started very softly and lightly of, no, you're not allowed to express yourself fully, Um, whether, and it, 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 the first so just experience like the self-limiting like just you're not even yes. giving yourself permission yes to so up any different way exactly so okay. I thought the coast was clear <laughs> right and I could you know it's like it's over you can come out and so right. I came out um within the you know what I perceived to be the safety of this relationship right. and what I learned very quickly Mm-hmm. was that it was uh it was not so it was not safe to do so and that my ideas and my um who who I was being mm-hmm. um in terms of being bold and being mm-hmm. expressive mm-hmm. and being uh passionate and being so what I experienced was sexually um this was not um I was immediately um like shut down Right. So mm-hmm. the, the what, do you, you mean, know, do you mean to say that uh, it's like you, you were closed, like, you know, how you mentioned previously, you know, you people only knew a, an ounce of who you really were, like in terms of that, that distance that yes. you kept between you and others, because mm-hmm. it wasn't safe. Are you, do you mean to say that, like, you opened that boundary a little bit more? So you were, you were risking and yes. um, going outside of those bounds. Uh, because it's, oh, this is my husband. This yes. Is, I'm supposed to expose yes. more. And yes. so what you're saying to me is that when you exposed yourself a bit more, it didn't go so well. It didn't go well at all. Okay. And I got um, shut down and judged and basically um, like uh, correct, like um, what's the word when you chastised, right? Mm. I was chastised for being um, like, you know, unchristian or dirty right um mm-hmm. just for being um, a sexual being mm-hmm. right for being you know sexually expressing myself and my my desire right mm-hmm. to actually enjoy um being intimate and it's like no you don't do that right like mm-hmm. just basically don't participate mm-hmm. <laughs> right I don't want your input in this just you know basically just lie there and play dead um, and I'm like, okay, this does not feel honoring to me. So all of this, it's like, I, I knew, um, like, okay, this, this is not what I thought <laughs> I was signing up for, but okay, but this person is my best friend now. Like this person right. says they love me now. Right. And, um, and I've invested so much time <laughs> in this relationship right. now that how can it not, okay, maybe it's just, maybe I'm maybe I'm, I started questioning, like, maybe I'm just being too extra. Uh, Maybe I just, you know, get to look at this from a different angle and take what works and leave the rest. So if the sex piece is not great, then um, let me at least embrace the other things, right? And go all in on that and just be happy with that because they love me, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I can trust that. So, but then, you know, over time, it just bled into everything else where um, it was very clear and very, um, you know, they had shared that essentially I don't get a vote, like just be there. Um, Like you can just be in this relationship, but I don't want the distraction of you being you (laughs) was the message. Mm -hmm. 
right? Which was really um, jarring because Mm -hmm. I was still trying to make sense Mm -hmm. of how to fix this, right? right? How do I fix me (laughs) to fix this? It's like I'm hearing you say while you're trying to fix, you're you're continuously trying to modify and adjust yourself. Yes. So even though you might have thought at some point you're you're being bold and you're you're using your voice, but um, you were not really being true to yourself and no speaking, honoring your true process. Not at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. And through it all, um, my you know, and I'd have like you know, conversations with my, my guide. And I knew I'm like, this does not feel right, but it also doesn't feel complete. Like it doesn't feel over, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't feel over. So, um, what do I need to know (laughs) about this? Like, is this, is this for me? Is it, you know, I had a lot of questions, Mm -hmm. had a lot of questions because I was, I felt alone. Right. And I felt so it's one thing to feel alone and I've felt that before, but I'd mm-hmm. never felt lonely mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. quite mm-hmm. in the way that I did within a marriage. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, so it's like that's a deeper a, sense of loneliness. That's so a now you're, next you're, level. Yeah. It's like next level. And it's like, you know, people expect that you are connected because it's your husband. Yeah. And, and so maybe people even check in less or, Yes. Assume you have it going for you. And he was really um, fantastic at the um, the show, right? So Mm -hmm. he was always out outwardly affectionate, right? Right. He was just like, "Oh, my wife is the best," and just like fawning. He was so like, and you know, these must have been so confusing for you. It was grand gestures, you know, epic epic experiences, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, So it made it impossible. So, you know, as we went through this whole experience, as I said, we were together for 14 years and I was just like scratching my head going, how can this be? Right. Which Mm -hmm. is why I'm like, okay, it makes no sense. He's saying this, but he's being this right. So there was no, it was, Mm -hmm. there was no alignment and no, it just wasn't incongruent. Right. And um, and we would have conversations about it and I would ask about it. But, you know, he would also do a disappearing act where when I started chipping away too close at whatever his secret was, um, he would bail and he would disappear for like days at a time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, I didn't feel that I was allowed to um, expect an answer. Like I would ask a question, but you know, I am under no obligation to answer you, Rachel. Um, mm. And there was all this There's a lot secrecy. of rules, lots of rules, a lot of rules. And, yeah. And I described it as walking on eggshells. Right. Um, and be, then eggshells became a minefield because then the wrong question at the wrong time on the wrong day when the moon was just right would mean <laughs> that, you know, now it's your fault. So it's almost as if I felt like it was the perfect setup every time where mm-hmm. crap would happen. And then I would question said crap only to find out it was a trap. So that they could bail and then blame me and leave me holding like a steaming mm. bio, you know, bag of poo, right? Right. Um, yeah. So it was this cycle that just kept repeating itself, cyclical. and every time and it became cyclical for you. Oh, and you every know. time I would just go deeper and deeper into the sense of is how is this my, how is this my life, right? Right. And how did I get here, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I I just I I I didn't get it. I didn't get it. And, um, but it was what it was and I couldn't, you know, and then he was amazing at apologies, right? Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. I bailed on you or ghosted you. And, um, it's just that, you know, it's hard for me to, you know, be honest with you if I'm not being honest with myself. So it's not you, it's me. And he'll like super explain it. I'll be in, you know, and I'll be like, oh, okay, well, because you have awareness <laughs> around what it is that's happening, then there's hope. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you felt hope, but it was such a, 
Oh my a God. sense of hope, right? There's all that accommodating yeah. that you were doing. And it almost sounds like there was like a few elements of like gaslighting in there or some. I would say like that term, I, I wasn't aware of that term at that at time. time. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, but when I did like, once I became aware of it, you know, in the last few years, I'm like, that was so my life. Right. <laughs> right. I'm like, and now I have a word. It, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and and the 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 crazy piece, you know, um, was that I he had my family enrolled, oh. right? So then I felt really and really a, alone and lonely because they knew me as being, you know, um, speak your mind, bold, mm-hmm. right? But they described it as rude. Rachel, you can be very rude. Um, so that was the judgment around it. So now when he, my ex now, you know, would express that or like something would happen or there'd be a falling out, the automatic default is Rachel must have done something. So once he latched on to that, it didn't matter how accommodating I was being within the relationship to the point where I became unrecognizable to myself. I twisted myself into a pretzel of like compromise Mm -hmm. um, that even my family was now like rooting for him because they couldn't see the game. Right. Because he wouldn't show that part of it. It It's like Jekyll and Hyde. Um, He wouldn't show that part. And all they would see is just my reactions and my response um, and judge me based on what they believed uh, right. me to be, right? So, and he mm-hmm. used that. It was masterful, masterful. And he was, you know, in his survival mode too. So it was just not a great situation. Yeah, it, it certainly um, sounds like there was so many, like, tiny pieces that really together combine, like, so much. And as you said, I think at the beginning of our conversation, somewhere in the beginning, you said that, you know, at the heart of all of it, there's all this hiding that I've been doing, but that there were several arms of this, right? And so even the marriage being one arm, I feel like there were all, like, I think of an octopus, like all the multiple. Yes, exactly. All the additional, (laughs) like, tiny arms, you know, going into all these little tiny Tentacles. Yes. Yes, exactly. And I'm just like, wow, that is so wild that I I can't imagine what you were going through and how you did it. But, you know, hats off to you for (laughs) working that process, you know, like, I'm, I'm just beside myself as I, as I, you know, I can't put myself in your shoes. I did not experience that. I don't know, but I'm just like the whole time I'm thinking brave, courageous, outrageously courageous, you know, (laughs) thinking all these things, these thoughts are just to me as you, as you share, you know, that, that gets me curious, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel, when people come to see me for therapy, you know, people are typically in one of three places. Some people are getting started, some are in the middle and some are looking back, right? What I mean by these three phases is that sometimes people are getting started, meaning they, they don't know what they're supposed to work on, but they know they're supposed to work on themselves. Um, but sometimes people have quite a number of messes that they are now ready to um, delayer and work through. Some people are in the middle where maybe there's something acute that they're working on while they also are aware that there's a lot of unfinished business in their life or a lot of untapped grief or, you know, different elements of their life that have you know, really need to be explored. And, you know, some people are looking back, they've moved through a lot and accepted uh, a number of circumstances, but also recognize that I need some closure. I need to, you know, uh, get some understanding so that I can move Mm -hmm. forward or move into the next chapter of what's to come. So based on that, what part of your untold story journey would you say that you're in? Would you say that you're getting started? Or would you say you're in the middle or, or looking back? Wow. Um, I would say as a last ditch effort, Samiwa, mm-hmm. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go and enroll and study psychotherapy so I can get my shit together. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And through that journey um, was my liberation, right? Where I came face to face with, you know, that's my healing journey. 
Mm-hmm. That's how all of that started. And, you know, seeing myself in the data and all of this work. And um, so I see myself looking back at what had happened and what I've experienced and what I've lived through. Yet I also see the reverberations in my current life, right? It's almost like, you know, transformation and phases. So Mm -hmm. I went through the initial, I'm looking back at, yes, that's what I was in. That's how I came through. This is who I was and this is who I am now. Mm -hmm. And then I now see all those pieces still, like those remnants. And now I get to dive deep into those and unpack them, which brings Mm -hmm. me to the, you know, coming out of hiding, right? Because through that, I was still hiding. Even when I came out of the relationship, I was still hiding. So there are elements of my past that are still very much in play today. But going back to this question and and you mentioning, well, with my ex, I don't believe I've ever, you know, stepped into, you know, full closure. But where in the journey would you say you are? I would say I'm looking back at it um, and still working on pieces that Mm -hmm. I almost like shrapnel. Right. I see that as, you know, because those were analogies I used while I was in the relationship where I'm like, you know, I felt as if I was being taken out by friendly fire. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm here, you know, battling life, you know, looking out into the world of where I don't fit in. Mm -hmm. And yet I'm in the pit and you're firing at me. Like, how Mm -hmm. is this to be? So I see myself looking back, but at the same time, very aware of the shrapnel that is still coming out. Right. Okay. And I'm picking them out, right? And seeing how that informs my current relationship because I've since remarried and um, how, you know, now I have, you know, we have three beautiful children. Mm -hmm. And every time I look at them, I'm reminded of the childlessness, right? The Mm -hmm. lack of fruit in my previous Mm -hmm. marriage. Mm -hmm. So it's like that weird juxtaposition of you know past colliding with the present every Mm -hmm. day Mm -hmm. yeah got it okay and if we can just circle back for a moment you know we've talked about so many arms of your story (laughs) and you know even at the crux of the this this theme of your supernatural gift and embracing it and that the the bigger theme of, you know, neglect and hiding so much of you and Mm -hmm. for so long and in so many ways and and with so many people and and, in in the different environments that you've been. Let's pivot for a moment and tell me how this untold story has affected your mental well-being. Um, At that time, my mental health, um, I felt arrested. I felt stuck. I felt um, I was just steeped in self-doubt. Um, I was, I ruminated a lot. Like I was just ru- not really thinking, just ruminating. I was just like it churning in the soup of, you know, um, just confusion. And I, I, I didn't feel connected to myself because I, you know, I numbed out. Um, to a large extent where I'm like, as long as I can't feel, then I won't feel pain. And then I can just, you know, put one foot in front of the other. And so just the mental head game um, I was playing on myself in order to just survive. So I was just living in survival mode and, you know, just never connecting to anyone or or anything too deeply. So I, 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 I wouldn't fully commit. So I was definitely a commitment phobe. Um, even though my desire was to be in these like deep, rich, long lasting relationships. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so I would be in that, but then mentally, um, I would just be just going around in circles, Mm -hmm. chasing Mm -hmm. my tail and questioning everything. Cause I, I didn't feel trust. Right. Right. And, so that translated into a lot of um, stress would be an understatement, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, anxiety, um, you know, but at the time I wasn't, if you had asked me. You might not have known what you were experiencing at the time, but now reflecting back, you can, you can recall yeah. saying, yeah, at that time, this is how I can tell you what I was experiencing. Yeah. 
at the time, mm-hmm. I just felt very alone, very isolated. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. as I said, lonely where, you know, I'm like, how can that be? Um, very confused. Um, and because I, I, I felt as if I was in a holding pattern because mm-hmm. I'd alluded, you know, I felt stuck. So then that rippled out into my life, which looked mm-hmm. like being stuck in my career, being, mm-hmm. you know, it affected my relationship with money. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't feel um, confident planning for the future mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. everything in the present felt so uncertain. Mm-hmm. And then I became, you know, very, um, I removed myself from social situations. So mm-hmm. even though I had this ability to be very like social and you put me in a, you'd think I was like super, super extrovert. Yeah. Um, I just disappeared inside myself and I right. wouldn't go out. I wouldn't meet up with friends. I wouldn't, mm-hmm. I just, I'm like, it's just easier because I don't want to have to explain myself. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have to explain how I'm feeling because, you know, mm-hmm. I don't have language for it. I just mm-hmm. know that I don't feel like myself. So I felt like I was in a prison Mm. I didn't feel free. And one of my big, you know, through lines is my freedom, like nothing messing with my sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I found myself in a situation where I did not feel free to do anything, to be myself, um, Mm -hmm. to go for anything. I I stayed very, very small. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. even that was not enough. It's definitely a roller coaster, a lot of different emotion, a lot of different thought processes, a lot of impact to your mental well-being, so many hurdles and so many moments of turmoil. And and it, it didn't just show up one at a time. You know, it sounds no. like sometimes it showed up in the most complicated way. So what's your key message to the listeners of our show, Rachel? What do you want them to know? Um, I would say, you know, who you are is legitimate and you are more than enough. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's something that I came to terms with, which is, you know, hence my headline, supernatural woman comes out of hiding to tell all. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not about pleasing others or being palatable to others um, or, you know, making sure that others are okay at, you know, at my personal cost. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have a place in this world. And that's the message I would share with others of you are who you are mm-hmm. and you have a place in this world mm-hmm. and you're more than enough. I love it. That's beautiful. Share with us what was game changing? What was pivotal for you? Like what was that game changing inspiration that's close to you that reflects your untold story that really sort of got you moving in the direction that you needed to go? So was there like an inspirational quote or a book or something that spoke to you? The one that comes to mind is speak the truth and leave immediately after. Um, And that has just always been with me. Um, Sometimes I understand it and sometimes I don't. Um, But it has been a constant of speak the truth, like be yourself, speak your truth. Mm -hmm. Um, And leave immediately after is like you don't owe anyone an explanation. (laughs) Right. You do you and you live your life. How, How powerful and insightful. So what is a cause or an organization that's been impactful to you that you really would like to give a shout out to? Who would that be? Yes, I would love, thank you so much for um, giving that opportunity, Salima. Um, Mm -hmm. One organization I would say um, is Dr. Raza's Healing Place. It's a center for, you know, the empowerment and healing of women and their Mm -hmm. children fleeing Mm -hmm. domestic violence. Mm -hmm. And so my experience there... um, really revealed because in doing that work and working with the women and being on the board, I began to see myself in the data because I would not have, I would not have known that I was in an abusive relationship because it was so, Mm. you know, insidious. Right. Right. Um, But in dealing with, you know, the data and the research and all the information and surrounding, just like hearing all the stories and I began to see myself in the data. And so Big shout out to Dr. Raza's Healing Place. Mm-hmm. Yes. That is such a wonderful resource. And I can see how personally you've been impacted by it so much. And it's been so um, anchoring for you in your process. Rachel, guess what? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've just dared yourself to share. Congratulations. What? Yes. 
<laughs> I oh my goodness, Salima, <laughs> this is so um yeah, I feel I feel seen. Mm. I feel f- like just free um that there's such a platform that you've created to be able to tell these um, you know, that I've been able to share my story that has been under lock and key and um and to put it out in the world that's definitely my headline (laughs) well you know I really appreciate that feedback and I appreciate that you're taking from this what the intention is meant to be so it for me it it it's food for my soul also so thank you so much for saying that and Rachel I would actually just like to take a moment to express my gratitude for the story that you've shared today. All of the many arms, you know, you finding your inner voice, embracing your gifts, and most importantly, really taking the time to share that pain and share that turmoil that you grappled with as you sorted through your your very own path. You know, it's just, it has been so inspiring. I'm really grateful that I have been able to hear and witness your story today. So thank you for the deep conversation and for all the daring and sharing. That really took some bravery. Thank you so much, Salima, for your platform. Thank you for um, creating that space, that safe space to be able to share. Thank you. Once again, Rachel, thank you for being part of Dare to Share Your Untold Story and helping to be a voice in breaking down the barriers of mental stigma. To all of our listeners, If you like what you've been hearing on this podcast and you want to be part of breaking down barriers of mental stigma, I invite you to go wherever you are listening to the episode and hit subscribe. Leave us a comment or a review of the episode and maybe how you relate to it. To learn more about what we offer, visit www.daretoheal.co. And if you are feeling ready and brave to share, please submit your story by visiting www.daretoshare.co. Thanks for joining in.